Thank you. Thank you for coming. Welcome guests, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, friends of the faculty, friends of research and science, uh, friends of computer science. Uh, today we will have an interesting discussion on the future of computing. And when we discuss about the future, we are asking our future colleagues or our future already existing colleagues, so the young colleagues newly appointed on their view of computer science informatics, which is a broad topic, so they will not cover all the aspects of the future of computing, but their view, they will provide their view on this future. I would like ask, like ask, to ask Hannes Fröhlich, who is the Vice Rector for Research and Innovation, since I have to excuse the rector, Sabine Seidler, she lost her voice, which is a bad thing, especially if you have to give a welcome address. So, Hannes has taken over the role to welcome you and give the welcome address. Thank you. Okay, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Uh, actually, I actually have to excuse because I am actually the person who is uh, who is responsible for the delay. Uh, I was actually informed only yesterday that I should overtake from Sivine Seiber. Uh, and so I had to squeeze this uh, into two uh, meetings and I also therefore cannot stay too long, maybe some 20, 25 minutes and have to leave again then. So uh, Sabine Seiber asked me to uh, substitute her because what we could have done without her was that we I would have played like Mashek, she makes, uh, so to say, the playback and I speak, so, uh, but we decided uh, I, I do it myself, yeah. Um, actually, um, I find it's a good idea to uh, substitute uh, the traditional, uh, so to say, opening lectures of, of, of colleagues uh, uh, with a panel, with a, dis with a panel discussion, because um, when the leverage is better, uh, uh, you see there's a, uh, a, a lecture hall full of audience and also uh, you have a, uh, a more communication and a more exchange process than to have consecutive uh, lectures maybe distributed over half a year or so. Um, uh, usually you have forgotten that what I have heard at the first lecture, the third and then maybe the learning effect is not so big and the information effect is not so big. Um, it's really uh, important uh, um, that we uh, have appointed these high class colleagues uh, within the last uh, the, 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 the last uh, what, two years nearly, nearly two years yeah um, all of them have uh, um, well are are uh, awardees of high uh, esteem awards uh, if this is ERC or STAR awards so are also very competitive uh, Vienna Science Technology Fund uh, uh, awards so this is really a, a high class uh, faculty that could be required here. Um, and uh, this is important because um, in times of uh, digital transformation, uh, this is a word uh, everyone uses, like Industry 4.0, and uh, many of those who use this word do not know what is really behind, and I think here you know what is behind, and so we can also uh, fill uh, these words with real research and with, uh, so to say, uh, competence uh, to build up this. The digital transformation is, I think, is a TU-wide uh, issue. Um, centered uh, in the core of, uh, of IT in the informatics faculty, but it's very important and I cite a, a I think a very important sentence of the of the report of the international advisory board you had uh, one half year, a year ago. Uh, they say the strength of computer science is, as a foundation discipline comes from the cross-disciplinarity and I think this is very important and I think the contribution and the participation of uh, informatics scientists in let's say uh, uh, um, um, the center of digital production uh, in digitalization uh, uh, transfer uh, courses and uh, in uh, industry uh, for the zero pilot uh, uh, pilot uh, um, so to say of fac uh, faculties uh, this is very important because I think this brings a, 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 a sort of a surplus and a, a, um, well, a value above the single uh, uh, discipline uh, uh, which is, so to say, a silo discipline that is now connected and interconnected by, by cross discipline. So, um, I would not like to um, keep you uh, off uh, from the 
uh, a very interesting upcoming uh, discussion. I also would like to mention it. I think the Dean will also mention it. We have uh, three women uh, out of five uh, appointed persons, which is uh, really a great thing. And um, uh, in the future, uh, I think we are really well prepared also within the discussions uh, that we will have within the next two years, maybe with an old ministry or not an old ministry. But I think uh, completely regardless of these form formal structures, we have to organize ourselves and we have to, so to say, we have to give the direction. And that's what we, I think, uh, uh, again, can show with this uh, uh, excellently, uh, um, um, so to say, acquired uh, panel of scientists. Thank you very much. And I wish us all a very uh, interesting uh, evening. Thank you. There is now a second excuse. You may think there is an, academic, an epidemic disease uh, because also Josef Broker is ill. He told that yesterday. So I will be somehow the intelligent simulator of Broker uh, and try to moderate the discussion with the colleagues. Um, before we start with that, just some words. Why, why do we do this in this form, like an inaugural lecture, uh, which, by the way, they will do in a longer inaugural lecture later on for the faculty or for the university, is that the major objective is to leave the ivory tower, okay? To show that computer science is not only dealing with computer science, but that it's in a close relationship with industry, with society, with really shaping the future. And this we want to underline with this form of lecture, of an interactive lecture. And the second thing is to show the importance of scientific research in this context. It's not about, let's say, digitalization or innovation. It's at the basis of this is excellent research. Otherwise, we will not be able to compete as a university, as a faculty, or even as a country. And this we want to underline by presenting five young colleagues um, talking about the future, and in some sense, they are also the future, okay? Because they are the young guys which have to shape this what we will live or see in 10 years. So this is the reason we are, we are doing this. Going out of the, let's say, the university fence, discussing it in a broader in a broader audience, in a broader public, to making it clear what we are doing, that we are serving the public, we are serving the scientific public, as well as the economic public, and also the political system here in Austria. This is an important issue, because we are paid by the public, and we have to show that we deliver something. Okay? Um, the procedure is as follows. They will come up in a sequence which we have defined and give a short presentation. What is their research about? Maybe with a little glimpse into the future. Then you can ask maybe one or two short questions after each of these short presentations. And afterwards, we will have one panel round with the questions I will raise. Then we have time for questions from the audience. And the, at the end, we will have a wrap-up, okay? So this is more or less the program. At the end, the highlight will be the wine and the water outside and some fresh bread we have prepared for you. Um, okay. So I would like to start and call Ivona Brandic. She's the first one. And it's really, as said by Hannes, uh, she has several awards. I just want to mention she has the FAF Start Award, uh, Start Prize grant. She's a member of the Young Academy of Austrian Academy of Science. And since 2016, she's appointed professor here for high performance computing, doing also your PhD at our university. So I ask Ivona to come up. Okay.
good afternoon and uh, welcome to my presentation. I'm very happy to start this presentation round. And I will talk today about runtime control of outer scale systems. I would like to start with one of the world's worst predictions that was given by Thomas J. Watson, who was president of IBM in 1943. And he said that there is a world market for maybe five computers. So let's have a time jump to 2017, where every single person has five computers, or 10, or 15. And there are also predictions that in a couple of years, we will have hundreds of computers per person, including sensors, smartphones, and so on and so on. So what is the problem? Let me give you some facts about this development. Google had in 2010 about a million of servers that needed 2 billion kilowatt hours energy. And Facebook had in 2012 about half a billion kilowatt hours energy consumption. And also in 2012, we had worldwide about half a million data centers that needed approximately uh, 30 nuclear power plants energy production to operate. And I don't even want to think about how many windmills we would need to produce that amount of energy. So the question is now, what is the solution to this explosion of the energy demands that we have nowadays? And there is a solution. One of them is here. Um, well, it's a desktop. But what I've done here, I have created a virtual machine. And a virtual machine is a simulation of a computer. It is an abstraction of a computer and a very powerful instrument in computer science because it decouples data and computation from physical entities. And I can start the second one, the third one, the fourth one. What I can do on a small scale, I can do also on a large scale, and this is called cloud computing. This is my research area. In clouds, we have a layer of physical machines. On top, we have virtual machines. And now, based on different environmental conditions, workload conditions, we can move data, we can move computation between geographically distributed data centers. And clouds are nowadays economic and ecological solutions to build data centers. And our team contributed significantly to the state of the, of the art in this area in the past years. So let's look deeper into the anatomy of a data center. And there are a lot of places in a data center where we can lose energy, but where we also can save a lot of energy if we act intelligently at the level of a network, at the level of servers, cloud management system, or also appliances. And we cannot afford it to tune all those knobs manually. No one can afford so many system administrators. So what we have done we have created autonomous loops to optimize data centers and energy consumption autonomously. And the best example for an autonomous system is our human body. We all sit in this room and we breathe and no one thinks about it, we just do it automatically. And that's what we have done as part of our WBTF project. In the next step, we looked into the distributed data centers that have completely different geotemporal conditions different outside temperature, different weather forecasts, or also different ratios of the green energy in the local grid. And based on that, we developed approaches to distribute virtual machines in order to save energy. And this was part of our Wissenschafts Prize that was given by Vienna University of Technology. And it was not enough. Nowadays, we have a lot of applications that cannot run on a single data center anymore. We have to deploy it on a multiple data centers anyway. So the question is, how can we analyze the application in order to deploy it in the most energy efficient way? Where are the low latency paths? Where are the parts of the application that are energy hungry? And that's the subject of our Start FWS project. And we use really ultra scale applications from uh, social media like Facebook, Twitter. We use real traces from Wikipedia to analyze uh, the application behavior. So what's next? Uh, if you look at this map, you can see the distribution of Netflix servers. 
And there are basically two major observations that we can have here. Uh, first, there are very few data centers that have more than 100 servers, just a few. And there are a lot of data centers that have less than five servers, or places where we have less than five servers. That means um, the size is getting smaller, right? And the next observation is that most of the data centers and most of the servers are located in the areas where we have high density of population. What does it mean? Due to the low latency demands of applications, we have to bring data close to the users. And we have completely new challenges on how our data centers look like. What you can see here, it's not a submarine. It is a data center. It is an underwater data center. You can put data center underwater, you get cooling for free, plus the half of the world's population live in coastal areas, so you get low latency. This is also a data center produced by Huawei that you can put into the corner of your office so you have your data close to you. And I also dare to say that this is also a data center, Raspberry Pi, it's the first hot data center where you can do a very simple, but still you can do computation. So the the next challenge that we have to cope with is the heterogeneity of data centers. There are no more big buildings somewhere. There will be everywhere around us in many different forms and flavors. And then the third challenge. Uh, my daughter is now two. She will have driving license, but her children won't. They will use self-driving cars. I don't think that anyone of us can imagine how much data such cars will produce. There is not enough time, there is not enough bandwidth to push everything to the massive data centers. So we have to develop new approaches how to cope with these issues. And there is a bunch of other life-changing applications, Industry 4.0, smart cities, personalized medicine. Just imagine you go to the pharmacy and you get medicine created for you without any side effects. So the pharmacist would have to collect a lot of data to, to do computation. The question is, can we still use in situ computing? This is the form of computing that every one of us knows. Classical approach, where the data is processed at the end destination. Or do we have to use in transit computing, where the data is processed stepwise, on the way to the massive data center? Continuum computing, where we share data experiences between multiple devices, multiple users to save energy. And the question is also, what is the energy demand that we will have in the future. And I would like to conclude my talk and to acknowledge all funding agencies for the general support and also my team who did most of the work. And I would also like to give the sources where I didn't have space on my slides. Thank you very much. Question from the audience, or because if not, so the the future is decentralized. I think so. Yes, in many many cases, the future will be decentralized because um, due to huge amounts of data, uh, I don't think that we will be able to do any form of centralized computing. Maybe in some cases, but in the most um, application areas, we will have decentralized computing. So we'd also do the computing on the edge, which means yes. not only on servers or little machines, but machines will be everywhere. everywhere. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so the next one, the next presentation fits very well with this. It's by Muhammad Shafiq. He is appointed last year. He is a now professor for computer architecture for robust energy efficient technologies. He will speak about new architectures and uh, brain inspired computing. He did his PhD, he's coming from Pakistan, but he did his PhD at KIT, which is the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology. He also has won a uh, grant or award from ACM, Outstanding New Faculty Award. I know that you have some grant by Intel, I think. That's the hardware, actually. Yeah. That's the hardware, actually, so they deliver the hardware for you. Uh, and he will talk about uh, brain-inspired computing and explain what's the relationship to new computer architectures. Perfect. 
So if you don't mind, I would like to go there so that you know I can have a clear look at, at my my slides also. So welcome everyone. Um, so in, in so ultimate vision of my group would be if I can get an answer to this kind of question that a kind of understanding of a human brain inspired the new computing architectures and paradigms for extreme energy efficiency and context awareness. And I'm talking about the chips uh, that can learn on the fly, that can enable your devices learn under various contexts, that can be used for improved privacy and efficiency customized to each of the user also. And then this we want to do at fully autonomous way kind of stuff. So here I have a snapshot of my previous projects. Um, I have worked extensively um, through the funding of DFG and uh, DRD and BMBF, which are actually the funding agencies in Germany. Uh, and my expertise span from low power computing to energy efficient computing to all the way to fault tolerant and um, adaptive or runtime adaptive current computing. And recently I got a Intel Hub uh, 2 platform which we are pushing for the data centers and uh, also I recently got a grant together with Radha Grosso on um, this IoT for CPS where we are looking specifically into the machine learning security or using machine learning for security and things like that. Um, um, now the vision of my lab is actually to um, research three to four fundamental problems in computing. So when I talk about computing, I'm really talking about the computing hardware and the corresponding runtime system which is very close to the hardware. Um, there, the first thing is I'm looking into the brain inspired computing because this is a very, very attractive and big um, research question uh, pushed by various um, top universities in the US and also by the industries. Um, then I'm looking into the robust embedded computing where I'm looking into um, the synergies between the reliability and the hardware security and try to address these questions from hardware to the runtime system really going across the um, across the computing stack and also looking into the application specific constraints into this thing. So I'm also looking into the near sensor processing for extreme energy efficiency, which would be inevitable when we are talking about the IoT devices deployed in farther regions, which will be located through the energy harvesting features like that. And I'm also looking into the, one of the projects as a sub drive version of that into on-chip systems for wearable healthcare. Uh, it's just that my passion, you know, to look into these kind of um, devices or systems which can really help uh, the humanity and the ecosystem around that. So I'm going to present in rest of the couple of minutes my vision towards the brain inspired computing and my motivation for that. Um, so we have seen that artificial intelligence has really paved its way all the way um, for the last several decades where we have seen that the IBM Deep Blue bet Gary Kasparov in 1996, then we also saw their IBM uh, Blue Gene uh, supercomputer also bet uh, two famous players in jeopardy and recently we have seen DeepMind's uh, AlphaGo beating the lay um, uh, settle for the uh, the Go game, which is very, very complicated, has a huge number of combinational um, or very, very large computer space. Um, so this is kind of what we are talking about, um, machines competing against a human being and they are thinking like a human or even surpassing their ability. But what we um, have to also see that there is a huge gap between the efficiency between a human uh, person and the machine. And we see is that these supercomputers operate at 200 kilowatts to 1 megawatt, you know, just for this competition, while our brain works at 20 watts. And that's the holy grail question of the whole brain-inspired computing paradigm. Can we achieve this kind of intelligence at an extremely low power budget, in the best case, close to a human brain? But on the other hand, if we can understand the brain very well, we can actually, you know, surpass the capabilities and improve it um, beyond the level. So power efficiency is only one aspect. There are a huge number of other cool aspects of a human brain that are, uh, it's the learning capabilities. The learning capabilities are diverse. It's multi-layer cognitive. We have both supervised and unsupervised learning. Uh, we have scalable effort computing going on into our brains, which we don't find you know, really these days in the computers, and really diverse processing in parallel. And then what is also a great feature is the fault tolerance and self-healing. There is a lot of degeneration going on in our body, in our brain, and our brain adapts actually not only itself but also the body functioning. Can we exploit these kind of features to self heal and increase the internal robustness against unknown threats that could be reliability or also security and things like that? So, this slide actually, which is the last one here, now is going to give a slight roadmap what I am pushing in my group. 
Um, so the applications, of course, we all know that the hot application is big data processing, uh, Internet of Things, CPS, and of course, when we are talking about brain-inspired computing, we are really targeting the data-abundant kind of applications. We stand today at the software-based implementations where we see heavily the use of GPUs and things like this. So one of my students has actually developed now this kind of stuff, um, really implementing the neurons and the GPUs and seeing that what are their power consumptions. The next step that the community is now pushing is approximate computing, which is a scalable effort computing kind of thing that our brain does, which means that if today you, you, you give an input to your computing machine, it always gives you the same output with the same efficiency. While your brain actually adapts, it optimizes continuously on the fly, and it doesn't need to do, you know, the processing with the same effort every time. I am I looking into recognizing each person in the room, or I am counting the number of people. There are two different types of processing happening. And approximate computing is something which a lot of companies also pushing, and also uh, big research groups in the US. So we have quite uh, you now good standing worldwide in this topic. Other thing is the deep learning architecture. Everyone knows about that. What we are doing is actually defining or architecting highly energy efficient deep learning pipelines. But then what we are also looking into now currently is that what is beyond deep learning. You know, what would be the true neuromorphic architectures that can, for example, surpass the uh, models which are realized, for example, only using the deep neural networks and things like that. And recently we have seen is that, um, I think a couple of weeks ago, IBM released their million fish in memory, in memory computing <coughs> as a principle. And this is also very important to know that the post CMOS technologies are the ones which are enabling the beyond von Neumann kind of computing architecture. And this is very important that we need to bridge this gap bringing the technological people together with the computer architects and computer science to devise the next generation computing principles. And that's what is my ultimate roadmap coming closer to things. And of course, these two are really, really the starting points in the community. And these are the big research questions that we have to answer and address. And my goal is to establish the leadership of TG Viana worldwide in these topics. Thank you very much. Audience? Roderick. Um, so, short question. Uh, people sometimes prefer to use computers instead of people because people make mistakes. Computers don't. Um, when we start learning, do we do computers, will computers start making the same mistakes humans do or can we still guarantee things? <laughs> So actually, uh, I have a very different standing from this. So computers also make mistakes, you just, just don't see them. You know, we have faults in the hardware, we have faults in the software and things like this, but the way we design today computing is very, very over-designed, over-provisioned. We have a lot of guardians and hardware and software is also things like that. So first of all, this. But actually, the learning principles, we human, when we make mistakes, we learn and we can correct that. And we can improve our efficiency by practice and things. So my goal is also that exploiting these kind of phenomena so that these computers, even if they face errors or reliability threats kind of thing, they can learn on the fly to prohibit them. Then you can actually really reduce the cost of your system and improve the efficiency. I would have many more questions now, but no doubt after. You can ask me on the panel. You know. Thank you. Now we are talk about security and privacy in the digital society by Matteo Maffei. He is with us since, since when? Since March you are with us. April? April, so I was not even. And he also received several awards like the Emmy Noether Fellowship from the German Research Foundation. Uh, he was previously with the University of Saarland, originally coming from Italy. So he will do his presentation in Italian. <laughs> okay, <laughs> Matteo, the floor is yours. Thanks. Zarlandish, uh, yeah, that's any shop, man. All right, so the start of this talk is in honor of one of the most favorite topics of our DIN digital transformation. So if we look <laughs> back 15 years ago, we see actually objects that we barely recognize today. Right? People used to write the appointments on books or actually to go to some physical travel agency and you know to search for their 
press trip or to go to a bank and fill in some forms in order to pay for their electricity bills every month or store documents in huge archives from where it was essentially impossible to retrieve any kind of document, right? And today, instead, the situation has completely changed. People mark their appointments in their mobile phone, which they can conveniently carry with them. They use just the booking.com or similar websites to instantaneously book uh, flights uh, during the lunch break, maybe. Financial transactions are uh, all done through e banking technologies. And we store documents in the cloud in a way that we can make them actually accessible to our friends or colleagues. And this is great, right? This has simplified and made our life better. But we have paid a price for all of that. And the price is huge, is our right to security and privacy. The problem is that the technologies that we use today are fundamentally insecure. If we look at them, I can tell you that probably right now, some of the apps that you have installed on your device are leaking personal information about you, like uh, address book or your geographical location, to servers which we don't know. The majority of the websites that we use are actually vulnerable or have already been hacked. Probably you don't know that, but the majority of the banks and the credit card companies are using today blockchain technologies for which we know just a little. They use them for any kind of cross-border or cross-currency payment. And, well, companies like Dropbox or, uh, or Yahoo are constantly hacked and lots of credit cards, passwords are leaked. So this is a fundamental problem. But we want to retain our right to security and privacy. And this was a concept that, that was already studied more than one century ago, when another transformation was taking place, when journals, newspapers, photos were becoming reality. And two eminent lawyers wrote, for the first time, a definition of privacy. And they said that essentially the privacy is the right to be left alone. And let me share this sentence with you because I think it's extremely modern and applies to what they do. That individual shall have full protection in person and in property is a principle as old as the common law. Political, social, and economic changes entail the recognition of new rights, and the common law in its eternal gulf grows to meet the new demands of the society. Now the right to life has come to mean the right to enjoy life. And in order to enjoy our life, we need security and privacy. And then the United Nations precisely said what this right to be let alone consists of. No one shall be subjected to arbitrary or unlawful interference with his or her privacy, family, or, or correspondence. Communication technologies should be secure nor to unlawful attacks on his or her honor and reputation. And the upcoming data protection regulation reform in Europe next year puts stringent requirements on the side of companies and stakeholders in order to implement these principles. So the goal of the research of my group is to make it possible from a technological perspective to retain our right to security and privacy in the digital society. Technically, this is uh, achieved, or we work on that, uh, following two research strands. On the one hand, we develop verification techniques that can formally and rigorously prove the intended <coughs> security properties for the programs we use every day, such as web applications, mobile applications, the cryptography protocols that are supposed to secure our internet communication. And on the other side, we develop cryptographic solutions to protect the privacy and security of users in online services like cloud services or upcoming technologies like blockchain. And I will uh, highlight as a showcase of this research the topic of security and privacy in uh, blockchain technologies. We hear about the blockchain a lot. What is, is this about? It's a new network protocol that makes it possible for parties that are mutually distrustful to reach a consent on the common state of a program. And this is achieved by a concept called the ledger, which is a growing data structure that tracks all user activities. And once this setup is in place, it's possible to build programs that stay secure and running in a completely distributed environment without need for any trusted third party. And while this is great, in principle, it's a new communication paradigm, at the same time comes 
with lots of problems that we have to solve. First of all, having a data structure that tracks user activities by definition compromises the privacy of users. Next, a data structure that grows over time by definition is not scalable. And for the applications that we want to build on top of this data structure, well, we have to keep in mind that they are meant to be used in a financial setting. So each single bug, each single vulnerability is going to cause a huge financial loss. So this is the place where verification technologies play a fundamental role. So for instance, our group has recently developed the first, technically speaking, so-called privacy-preserving payment channel for Bitcoin, which is a, a new way to mitigate scalability issues in Bitcoin and at the same time to prove rigorous privacy guarantees for end users. And this is a protocol that is ready uh, to be adopted as a service in Bitcoin. And we are also working on techniques to formally verify the so-called smart contracts, which are the programs that we can build on top of blockchain technologies. And uh, this research has been also funded by NetID. So to conclude, we have lots of challenges today already, but new challenges are coming in the realm of security and privacy and will become more and more important in the next years. So first of all, machine learning is going to be used everywhere. Machine learning is one of the fundamental concepts today of our uh, digital society. And we have huge security and privacy problems there because machine learning is not resistant at the moment at, against adversaries that can influence the learning and training phase. Also, the privacy of user data, the privacy of the models used in the machine learning algorithms are very important. At the moment, it's a challenge to preserve that. Next, we live in you know, now smart cities. Self-driving cars are becoming a reality. Here, it's crucial to protect the communication among the sensors that are supposed to synchronize the activities of human beings and machines, and at the same time, to retain the privacy of users while they are constantly tracked over time and over space. And finally, quantum computers might become a reality in the near future. And should this happen, many of the cryptographic algorithms that we use today to secure our society are going to be completely broken. So we need fundamentally new cryptographic mechanisms. And this is an area called the post-quantum cryptography that will become more and more important. With that, thank you for your attention. Question from the audience. Radu, short question. <laughs> Can security and privacy go hand in hand? So there is a trade off between them. No, there is no trade off. Security and privacy can going hand in hand. In fact, it's even possible to track activities and to do that in a privacy preserving manner. For that, we have uh, developed as a community lots of uh, magic cryptographic mechanisms that are used also in our society at the moment. Things like zero knowledge proofs uh, or secure multi-party computations uh, are an instance of these uh, developments. So indeed, it's possible to have both security and privacy. There is no trade-off. We don't have to sacrifice either of them, we can enjoy both of our rights. Could you, the blockchain, because you need an enormous computing power, okay? Could Ivana help you? Everyone can help us. The <laughs> <laughs> I believe that blockchain is among, yes, uh, the blockchain is among uh, uh, the most interdisciplinary research fields at the moment because combines ideas from game theory, economics, cryptography. There is the problem of mining and having efficient centers for doing that. That's definitely the area where Ivona's help would be very much appreciated. So yeah, blockchain is a welcoming field. And I guess it would be fun for many of us in the future. Thank you. And we are expecting some crowns. The sequence of presentations seems to be somehow reasoned, no? Because we talked about reliability and verification, and now we have Laura Kovac talking about software reliability and automated reasoning. So making the things at the back. Uh, 
what Matteo somehow mentioned also, and he's cooperating with her. And she's with us since April 2016. She's a professor for automated reasoning, and she got in Sweden because she also has a part-time appointment with Chalmers University. She has the Swedish Wallenberg Academy Fellowship, and she received the ERC starting grants in 2014. So, Laura, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. So, yes, I am back again because I've been at Temuvin and I, am, uh, I went away to Sweden. And in the meantime, I got an ERC starting grant and I thought, okay, maybe it's better to come back to uh, Austria, in particular to Temuvin, where actually logic, this is the area of my research, where logic is basically the main topic, one of the main topics of the university, and it's also the, actually the strength in the excellence research of Austria. And in my research, it's logic, but automated logic, and this is the field that we call automated reasoning. And I want to convince you that basically automated reasoning is the right tool, or is the tool that is used in, uh, in ensuring software reliability. So why is that? Why do we care of software reliability? Well, we all know that our civilization, our society runs on software, and here just a few examples. Microsoft, which is the world's most valuable company, one of the world's most valuable companies, software company produces software that is used on a daily basis by our society. When I was lucky enough to work in Sweden together with Volvo, autonomous cars are everywhere in the news nowadays, and those cars are also operated by software. And just similarly, the, uh, the recent flyjet uh, fly of Saab, the Griffon flyjet, is also operated by software. So I put these three examples as the showcases of the application of my research in Sweden, and I hope to have it also further in Vienna. Now, in all these cases, and all other software examples, uh, if software errors happen, they are very costly. Actually, they cost the reputation of the company. But in actually, even, even worse cases, they can even cost human lives. And now I claim that in order to analyze and verify software, that you also heard in the talk of um, Matteo, we need automated methods. So I claim that manual methods are not any more commercially viable. And why is that? So this is an example program. Some of you have already started, but I just revisit it. So this actually it's a partial uh, screenshot of our so the screenshot of a partial code of our own software, the Vampire software. I'm going to come back to that particular software a bit later. It's about 200,000 lines of code, but it's really a small to medium-sized software in our in, in, in uh, nowadays software development. So basically, what you should interpret about this, all I hear is that every line in this particular very miniature picture, it's, a, it's one uh, line of C++ code. Now, I, so this is kind of like a software that we need to deal with. When we, we want to ensure that it's uh, error-free, or we want to ensure that it's reliable. So now, this very fictive software, there is a very simple piece of code. Those of you who are computer scientists and are familiar with C-like languages, you might now read uh, this particular uh, piece of code. But there is a specification, so the, the, the developer who wrote this piece of code has a specification, that every element in an output array, well, I don't know, memory is, uh, C, it should be a negative element, element from a source array. And now this is a specification, and a developer wrote this particular piece of code, and now the task of software verification, or automated verification, is to ensure that indeed this particular piece of code satisfies this particular property. Now you can start reading and understanding the code. And here's a guess. You might guess, is this indeed making the specification or not? So who is for yes, and who is for no, and who is different. And usually, although we, I do like to work with logic with 0 and 1, there is in many cases the answer unknown. Okay? And this is actually happening in this scenario. But basically, the answer is no. Uh, let me just come here. Because there is a very simple syntactical error. Okay? Instead of a small a, one type of c here, and this specification, that the previous specification doesn't hold anymore for this particular program. Now, how can we reason about such errors? This is the task of program analysis, it, together with computational logic, because when you speak of such properties, you need to formalize it in some language. And the language I propose is first of the logic. You don't need to understand it. It's quite technical. I wanted to have also a bit of technicality in the slide. But what I want to highlight is very, very simple natural language property. If you formalize it in first of the logic, it requires so-called alternations of quantifier. Even one quantifier in a property is very hard to come up with, but this is actually required as a national quantifier, it's quite, a plump, quite a complex property for this very simple piece of code. And I claim that 
that with such kind of properties we can generate automatically using the methods we are developing in my group. Now, the other challenge in uh, software development is not just the size of the code, but this particular software error that is lying in this piece of code, the, the issue is that, that this piece of code might be actually referenced from some other program location and might reference in following another program location. So in order to find an error in a software, it does not suffice that you now linearly traverse line by, uh, line, by one, uh, line by line the code. You really have to be aware that there are different jumps in the software and you have to kind of reason about that, uh, that particular jump. So in our research, we, had, uh, we developed logic-based methods to, uh, to catch such bugs. And I might ask, okay, what is our recipe? When I claim that our recipe is not very novel, it had been there actually in the middle of uh, last century, and it's actually coming from someone who is not even in the field of logic. And our recipe is this one. When we prove properties, we really want to satisfy properties, okay? And it's very hard to satisfy properties in all possible scenarios. And this is what we do. We don't, we try, we don't succeed, we try again, don't succeed, and we don't, we don't stop until we succeed. And this is actually coming from the Rolling Stones. And this is the recipe that, that is built, it's yielding research in automated reasoning, and in particular my research group. So the task of how I, I, I'm using the automated reasoning, the task is, for software reliability, the task is that if you're given a software program, show that it has no errors. Okay. Now this particular task is very similar if you look at a mathematical textbook. Okay, because this formulation is actually a theorem. Okay, this is the task of a theorem that mathematicians or students in our university have to prove. So mathematicians know how to prove theory, right? So they are very, very uh, developed methods in mathematics. So the message in my research is, if you know already to prove theorems in math, then why don't, you, why don't we use math to prove theorems in, in uh, computer science? And this is actually what we do. We use mathematics for proving the absence or the presence of a software bug. And now it's a bit technicality, but what is our work scenario? So, we develop automated reasoning, logic-based methods, okay, math-based methods, for generating program properties that actually find and, and uh, prevent errors, the creation of errors by software developers. And for that, so I put again the property, but here the two keywords. So we use symbolic computation, which is just computerized math, and first the theory improving, which is computer assisted theory improving. So we use mathematics and logic in a computer in a, in a computer assisted manner. And then we need to prove these properties because if we prove it, then we ensure that the software is error-free. However, there's a challenge, because we don't really prove only on zero and one, only on the Boolean level, but we do uh, prove in full first of the theories of various data structures, where you have integer operations, where you have operations of array, array lists, and other things. So we really have to reason about the various properties of different data structures, and this is why uh, full first of the uh, reasoning is required. And we do all this, although I'm, people say I'm quite theoretical, fine, theoretical, theory is, is good, it's the underlying research of applied research. And we do all this, even the theoretical, we do all this completely automatically by, by developing our own uh, software. It's called the Vampire Theory Improver, which is the world uh, leading theory improver in first of the theory improving. So with the results of Vampire, or with the existence of Vampire, we claim that software developers do not need to be um, experts in logic. They can just use our methods and apply our logic-based methods to prove their uh, product to be error-free. So in my group, we are combining symbolic computation, that is computer-supported math, with first the theory improvement that is computer-supported reasoning, and all this for ensure the healthy program analysis and verification. And the research, you already heard, but I would like to acknowledge that it's supported by an ERC starting grant, which I received in 2014, but due to maternity leave, I only started in 2016 at the Feudin. It was supported by the Swedish Wallenberg Academy Fellowship, which is similar to the, has the same message, or same mission as the Austrian Staatskreis, as well as from the Swedish Research Council and the Austrian Science Fund. So now with that, I would like to conclude that, uh, just to highlight that indeed automated reasoning is increasingly applied in industry. Companies such as Facebook, Facebook recently bought Monoyovics, which is applying automated reasoning. Amazon is using automated reasoning to, uh, to in, in a program analysis, the Microsoft, Intel, Siemens, these are all companies that do rely on various aspects of automated reasoning. Now, program analysis and related automated reasoning problems are very hard. 
their theoretical uh, results showing the limitations what we can do. And since they are very hard, I believe that we are going to be kept busy for the next 100 years or even more. So we are going to be eternally happy to make research in automated reasoning. And uh, finally, I do want to mention that really, uh, I think automated reasoning is one of these areas where really academic research is needed. So academic basic research is needed to develop new algorithms and tools for automated reasoning. And these new methods and tools that are developed in academia are going to further use in the software industry. They are already used and they are going to be further used. Question from the audience. Anthony. How far are we from? Sorry, thank you. Um, how far are we from getting software developers to use automated theorem proving? Right. So I think that that is also one of our uh, main missions, right? So that it's really hard to, to convince software developers. It would be great if they would use it from day one. But I think it are, and it would be great that if logic and mathematics are better taught at universities. But I think we have to leave with a current scenario that it's not, okay, and what we should do, that we should develop the methods such that they are very easy to be used. And uh, basically software developers at Amazon, they were using Vampire as for our tool, and it succeeded. So that's the thing, to, make, to provide the right instruction how to use the tool, and then I, this is, I think, where automation is useful better than interactive theory proving. Yeah. How, how does it scale? Uh, sorry, scaling. What's the size of programs you are <laughs> managing? Right, so I think here I have, to make a, uh, I have to make one comment because all these things is working in a, a longer chain of program verification and there are tools that are like, like device driver verification, they can scale bit, very big code, okay, and then they extract the property that they want to prove and this is the property that we get. Okay, so we cannot do everything alone, we're actually working with verifiers, model checkers, test case generators and another thing further. Okay, thank you. So now we come from classical logics to non-classical logics. Uh, we are happy to have Agata Ciappatoni with us. She also had a start prize grant from the Austrian Science Foundation. She has numerous grants uh, from the Austrian Science Foundation on her project. And she is, since 2017, she is professor here, appointed professor, full professor for um, non-classical logic. She did her PhD at the University of Milano. Is this right? And yes, the floor is yours. Okay, hi. So I'm a professor for non-classical logics in computer science and me and my group are working on their theory, tools and applications. So I can well imagine that in contrast with the other talk, this title does not tell you much. So that's why I thought to start from the very beginning. So what are non-classical logics and why are they useful? So we have seen already in Laura's talk that classical logic is great to, deal, to reason about software errors, but it's also extremely good to talk about uh, design, hardware design or about mathematical statements. Actually, mathematical statements, so think about a lemma, a theorem, can be either true or false. However, this tertium non datur idea does not apply to all contexts. And actually, we might, we might want to reason about statements that, that are true up to a certain degree. So for instance, having high fever or having strong pain. So in this case, we would reason instead using a logic within the family of so-called fuzzy logics. In general, actually, different application domain might require different languages, namely different logics. So for instance, to talk about obligation and prohibition that are key concepts <coughs> in law, or to talk of, to reason about time, or to talk about resources that can be limited in numbers. So for instance, I want to distinguish between having one occurrence of a resource or having twice. And the, actually, the situation is like that. So there are very many interesting and useful 
logic, so non-classical logics, logic different from classical logics. And practitioners in various areas keep on introducing new ones to fulfill their needs. So those logics are different from classical logic, actually, and in many cases they are much more complicated. And if we want to use them for practical applications, we actually need first to settle some foundational questions. And actually, I'm working on those foundational questions within the framework of my start trend and also a newly founded SDS INR project. And among the questions we are dealing with, we are introducing uh, reasoning tools for non-classical logics, uh, investigating the data decidability status, uh, useful semantic properties. But the main point of my foundational research actually is to find results which are general, that works for large classes of logic, not just one by one. But actually, I'm also interested in, in applying non-classical logics to diverse context. And I, I will make just some examples to, to give an idea of uh, actually what you can do with, with those logics or actually what we, uh, we did and we have been doing. So by using Perry logics, we have analyzed and actually improved an expert system for internal medicine developed at the Vienna Medical University. On a completely different topic, we are currently working on the extraction of core concurrent languages out of a large class of logics. And to be slightly more precise, we extract them out of suitable reasoning tools for those logics in the form of natural deduction and obtaining um, parallel lambda calculi, featuring mechanisms for the exchange of messages, and actually each logic gives a different mechanism. But all of them uh, so support some form of code mobility. But actually, let's say, the long-term goal of this research would be to provide some logic-based languages for building sophisticated communicating systems which are correct and secure by design. So actually, here, there is a strong connection with Matteo's work, and we are actually discussing this topic to see us, the theoretical people, which are the features that our language should satisfy. Uh, the third application, and the last one, actually, that I'm going to present is maybe slightly exotic, but can somehow support my view about the future of computing namely more and more computer application to diverse areas, and also uh, computer systems that can reason in a more and more sophisticated way. So together with an amazing group of Indologists, namely people actually working in Sanskrit studies, we are extracting logics out of the Sanskrit text of Mimamsa. So Mimamsa is a fundamental philosophical school, Indian philosophical school, which had a profound impact on philosophy, theology, and law. It's really very important. And uh, the focus of the school is actually to interpret the prescriptive part of the Vedas, the Indian sacred text. And that's what they, have, they did for almost two centuries by actually analyze them as they were legal texts. So the logics that we are extracting out of the text and actually the reasoning tools that we need to introduce to use them are, we are currently applying them mainly within the BBTF project to provide a better understanding of the Mimata text. But let's say our long-term goal would be to use them for formalized legal reasoning and also for reasoning about ethical machine, which is a topic which has never been more important than today. Thanks for your attention and I welcome your questions. Question from the audience. I have one. 
isn't it needed a meter model to somehow automatically decide on which type of logic to use in which domain so that you have some domain properties? That would be very nice, so, but I think it's somehow unrealistic. Unfortunately, here, let's say, it's still the human who should decide which is the, the appropriate language, I think. Could you combine it with some machine learning? Things in the of course, I mean, logic is everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> of course. So you are, you believe Gottlob's statement? Absolutely. You know Absolutely. Gottlob's statement? I mean, you have the, seen, I mean, even in Sanskrit studies, you can find logic. So if no. you find it there, can be. The can statement be. of Gottlob is that a computer yes. scientist... It's the continuation uh, of, of logic by other means. Yes, by other means. Right. <laughs> Who is agreeing with this statement? <laughs> Who is not agreeing with this statement? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. So we have, so we need some meter model on that. Thank you. May I ask now all the presenters to join me at the panel? Thanks for your excellent presentation, showing the, how, how broad the research at our faculty is and also the different challenges. And what we will do, I will have now one question to the panel. I ask for a short question and then I will pass over to you so that you can raise your, your issues. Uh, because what me would, I, I would be interested in seeing your field or the computer science or computing in 10 years, okay? When you look forward to 10 years and how this would also be in relationship to our societal challenges and how could it look like? It's a very technical but at the same time philosophical question. The, the sequence is up to you, which sequence you want to start. <laughs> So where the computing field I'm working on will be in 10 years. 10 years and what okay. is somehow this also this societal relationship, the impact, because we are, we are shaping somehow the future. What might the society yeah. look like you are impacting by the work you are doing? Okay, so um, the first part, um, the impact to science, I think that um, there will be much more interdisciplinary science because um, in most parts of my research field, uh, we have to look into particular application, whether it's uh, inter-car communication or smart cities or whatever. So, um, and I have an example, we have also um, cooperation with Boku, uh, which is, I would say, the pre preliminary of on-demand medicine, where we um, analyze DNA on demand and so on, and this can be used for um, for example, personalized cancer treatment. So the computation has to be done immediately on demand and the resources have to be free when you need them. So um, in order to understand how this has to be done, we have to work, we need computer scientists, we need bioinformaticians, um, we need um, biologists. So uh, I think this will be even more in the future that uh, the re results can only be delivered if we work together. And this will, of course, have impact on many other things. Um, I think that in 10 years we will have other um, occupations. There will be also the computer scientists will work in many other fields that are also very interdisciplinary. Is our curriculum prepared for that? I think our, our university curriculum where we have very strict subfields, just as a, just to be more interactive, you can say no, yes. Well, I think when, 
when I studied, I experienced three changes of the curriculum, and I was passed. I studied four years. Mm -hmm. So I think we are very dynamic. So I don't, I'm not concerned about it. Okay. Okay, so do you, do you want me to say something about the first? first about part? both or about yeah. two, okay. whatever So, I mean, want. one thing I would definitely agree is that we have to be interdisciplinary. We have to also train students in multiple types of sciences also, you know, because now we are looking into um, the era where we have uh, computing highly immersive, embedded pretty much in everything, you know, we are talking everything with the prefix smart, you know, and from smart we are going towards cognitive, you know, everything becomes smart to cognitive. Um, so we have to train the people uh, for all these different type of things. Plus we have on the other side of the coin also issues related to privacy, social and things which means they also should be trained with respect to ethics and all this kind of stuff. On the, on the other side, I will also say that if we would like to come up with the computing technology, let's say from my field perspective, then such kind of computing technologies, whoever is architecting them or designing them should also study, for example, psychological stuff or ethics and things like that, so that they can devise the policies which will control these kind of chips, highly amenable to our societal <laughs> challenges and things like this. Plus, you know, as we know that, I mean, psychology is, by psychology we can understand the way the attitude works and things. And if such kind of principles can be somehow laid in a form of a cognitive layer on these chips, you know, we can enable these chips to behave more societally and things. And from chips then I come to the systems, because you are deploying these chips or the computing devices into autonomous cars, into robotics, who are the personal assistant kind of stuff, to all the way up to the IoT devices. And you want these systems to work um, in in in, in highly uh, integrated way with your digital life, plus also in assistive way, not violating your social norms, your other kind of you know kind of norms. So that's why I think that these interdisciplinary studies are not only important for the um, for the students who are designing these systems, but also the persons who are using these systems. Matteo. Okay, very quickly I could answer the question by saying, well, our uh, community will catch up with the mistakes that the digital society will make in terms of security and privacy in the next years. But I think that this is not satisfactory. I think uh, that our community will be successful if uh, it will actually penetrate the different technical communities that rule the development of the society and will push the concept of security and privacy by design. That means that security and privacy should not be an a posteriori fix, which by the way will never be satisfactory or work completely, but instead should rather hard coded since the design phase of the new technological advancements. I also want to say... Yeah, interruption, sure. because we could also uh, have a new, fee, a new understanding of privacy. We could change. We have to understand, first of all, from a technological perspective, what privacy means. Yeah. That's one of the big problems at the moment. That there is no clear consent, even in our community, yeah, on that. The right to be I mean, the whole whole purpose of this, you know, that near sensor computing is actually that that whatever you want to do critical, this stays into your device, and you don't send it to cloud or fog or anything. You know. So that's just towards increasing the privacy. So there are new computing models also coming towards that. But I didn't want to, well, I interrupted, but I didn't want to interrupt. I think that these are the two points that I wanted to make. Concerning the importance of interdisciplinary studies, I agree, but then I actually throw a question or a challenge to the audience. How can we hope that our students get a broad background and an interdisciplinary view if we actually ask them, even in the bachelor, to specialize, even since the first year, and they don't have a, even a bachelor in computer science? <laughs> I, I second to that. You know, this is what we have seen that in all the top schools, it's not the case really. So we have to generalize. But we also have to um, open our borders. I mean, if you look at the top US schools also, they have cross-department uh, programs, which, I mean, at least I have, I mean, in my short time, I have not seen yet. I'm, of course, I completely agree on the interdisciplinary, of course, and actually, we should also, us, computer science, talk more with people from other areas. They might even don't know yet that 
actually they need us. And it's a matter of developing a common language and yeah, understanding how to communicate and how to interact. But where will your field be in 10 years? My field? Yes. I hope that we will have a lot of logics that could be used in really critical fields like ethical machine, so we are all talking about Google car, but how about if one of these cars has to, I mean, is in a situation where either has to crash against a wall or, I don't know, go over 10 children, so they should be capable of doing at least up to a certain extent, for instance, some kind of ethical decision. So, I mean, I would not go right now on a self-driving bus. I don't know whether you have seen, but like two years, two, two weeks ago, the first self-driving bus in Los Angeles just crashed against another car. So it's like that was a really bad starting point. At least it was a so bus. <laughs> yes, yes. And actually, we logicians should provide adequate languages for reasoning about complex things, but reasoning in a really secure and correct way. So not just, you know, we, we should not be satisfied in many applications that, okay, let's say, let's assume that it should work. No, it must work. And I can make another stupid example. Like some years ago, I went to buy a, a bottle worm for children. And like the lady at the shop was extremely proud that she told me, oh, I have this one that works with fuzzy logic. I don't know, thanks, I want a normal one. <laughs> 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 Maybe I, have to, I mean, it's, I know the, the joy of being the last, right? Like everyone was already saying um, uh, opinion, and I, I very much share the opinion of Matteo. Uh, it can even get worse if he starts going specialization in, uh, in uh, like not even undergrad, but even in, uh, in pupil, like in schools. That can be getting even worse. So I think our role at the faculty, just because of university, just because our field is growing so fast, we should teach all our students what are the principles, what are the basic foundations of computer science, and then let them specialize after three years basic education. So that's about uh, the comment I would like to make. And, and now about my field. So uh, clearly, like 10 years is a lot, uh, if one thinks. But I started research in 2003, so really my PhD in 2003. And at that time, uh, there there been uh, automated reasoning tools, first of Turing provers as well as SAT solvers. And SAT solvers within 10 years had, had this, I mean, by 2010. So at the beginning in 2000, SAT solvers, what are SAT solvers? SAT solvers are only operating with zero and ones, and they're very used in hardware. That was the main motivation, but a further use. So at the beginning, they were working with few variables and few properties. And within 10 years, 10 years of research, basically they're now addressing millions of clauses, millions of variables. Now, what, where are we in um, when this uh, in the first uh, theory improving without uh, with theories? Well, actually, we have few very few classes. We can have many variables that don't care, we don't matter. We don't care of variables because they are like part of our uh, our joy of treating them. So, what I would like to see in, in ten years, because it's really application driven. There are so many applications in computer science where different kind of data structures are. What is the right formalism to, to reason about heat? What is the right uh, arithmetic, linear, nonlinear arithmetic plus quantifier? So, this I think in ten years should happen that from handling only few variables with few clauses, like small problems, scale to the same uh, size that sex robots are doing, millions of variables and millions of clauses. And I think with the Internet of Things, we will have to face that. I will now go through the. Thank you. I will. Who has a question to the to the panelists? So I wonder, how will the revolution of machine learning change the profession of software development? Okay. Who wants to? The software guys. <laughs> Maybe you could. Um, more specify your question. <laughs> sure. So, machine learning changes many things. Uh, how, yeah. Uh, programs, uh, systems become more autonomous, so they learn actually doing things. Mm -hmm. So, many of the things that uh, people do when they do program uh, could be automated by actually a learning algorithm. So for instance, web, web design. Uh, I can 
easily imagine that um, I have a machine learning algorithm which uh, gradually learns how to make good web pages, much better than most uh, programmers can do. So in 10 years, I can imagine that um, all, most of the coding, programming, software development will be done by machines. So who, uh, can I, can I say, will we still need all these uh, software developers that uh, you guys are educating? So maybe maybe I can answer some some point of this and then Martin can go. So uh, recently, I think Martin Hirat from MIT he released uh, an automatic um, the patch apply. So what he has is a big uh, repository, and then he has a machine learning based uh, patching solution, which has also got a lot of attention. But it reminds me of a TV serial that I watched, like you know, Person of Interest, uh, where the machine actually uh, writes its own code. So it's evolvable software, for example, kind of thing. And I think in software engineering community, there are principles or let's say some research kind of directions where people are talking about such kind of thing. So it could pretty much happen, but I don't know if in 10 years, but definitely, you know, this is where the future is going. But it also raises alarms. Well, well I think that the, um, the, the borderline is where we need human creativity everywhere. So I don't think that uh, designing web pages, maybe you can automate it, but everywhere, if you need human creativity, you cannot use machine learning. I don't think that we can automate what we are doing, because we are scientists, or maybe, I don't know. So uh, you, you have to create something new, because you are human beings, so um, that's, that's the borderline, I think. And another thing is also the question, machine learning is very costly takes a lot of money and power and energy to execute it. So this is also the challenge for the future. Actually, it also needs a lot of data, and you don't always have them. I can tell you that, for instance, if you try to make some medical application, the doctors don't have such data. And plus, right now, the machine learning works like a black box. So you don't know really what's happening, and you want to be, in some, in some cases, be 100% sure that things that you are done are the correct one. The machine learning does not give yet this security. Maybe AI in general. I want to talk over the next question. No, no. <laughs> one, Maybe just a, perhaps a shed a positive light or be a little bit more optimistic on that. So probably we are not definitely now at the point where we can have automatic programming, but automatic programming is a, definitely a dream in the interesting research direction and I think that we are now in the position to take it. Uh, of course there are problems there, precision is one, uh, from my point of view security as well, so it's a challenge but I think that this is definitely a viable and an interesting approach and could become uh, uh, even the future from my point of view. Which also gives all of us a lot to do if we want to do it. Okay, just one comment, on, I mean so machine learning is one field of AI, right? And, and many things that we are doing is already in artificial intelligence. We just don't call it machine learning because we are not yet leaving this hype of machine learning. There are machine learning combination with software development. There are success stories in the UK, um, also in the US, that use it for software development. But just on the comment of automated programming, so there is a field already in, uh, in the computer science, which is reactive synthesis. And what actually is happening there is you start from a specification and you generate the code. So it is on along that line, but I still don't, so I also don't, I think human creativity should be still there. Human guided computer development will be there. And once we completely understand how our brain works and we can model that, okay, maybe the machine learning will produce robots that are replacing humans, but I think there is a long way until we really understand the entire piece of the brain computing. Maybe we should ask Gerti Kappel on model driven software engineering, but I'm not doing this now because you have some model underlying and then you could generate code and develop the code out of, of the model where we also have a professorship, but now the next question. I, I have a question for Agatha. It's maybe a little bit provocative. Uh, I must uh, say I'm a psychologist and I'm a little bit bothered when you say that you want to do ethical reasoning based on logics. Because I can imagine there are cases when uh, there are is uh, contradictor when there are contradictory situations. Imagine you have a kidnapper and uh, who kidnapped a child or several children, and you know that the 
child or children will die in 24 hours, are you allowed to torture the kidnapper to uh, get information about the location of the children? Uh, this is a very contradictory situation. And uh, my question is, do you think um, there is a kind of logic which can cope with these contradictions? No, not, not really, not really. I mean, of course, logic can help in some cases, but cannot replace human that it really way. But it can help, and it can make better systems, but not really as ethical as human. That is really not human to do on this work. Other questions? Okay, we have. I'm throwing it like. <laughs> Um, yeah, one question which is maybe a bit similar but maybe a bit more humble. So I talked recently a lot to lawyers because I was interested in the yes. things you were talking about, uh, reasoning about yeah. policies and about laws and privacy. And my, I, I it raised very many doubts in me. Yes, so yes, basically, yes, uh, because law is um, a, it seems to be very hard to formalize because the lawyers have to agree, and often it's the court case decisions which basically um, settle how a law is understood. And um, so it seems to me there is there is a gap on I this end, not absolutely. not I mean towards let, let, ethics. Let, let that's me the be, next level, but even there is already a big gap. Is me, there any hope to bridge that one? No. Let, let me be more precise because, of course, in a seven-minute talk, I could not give any detail. So the idea is not to have automated, like, court judgment. That that's really not possible. But still, logic can help in the law framework. For instance, when you introduce a new law to understand whether it contradicts something else, I mean, this kind of automated check could be done. So, for instance, what, what happened quite funnily in Italy that was a couple of months ago, like there was a new law for in vitro fecundation that was saying uh, that you can do it, in two people that are married can do it. But actually they didn't say that they should be married together. So and actually they realized the mistake afterwards and then they took it back. So this kind of check may, could be done, say, but not really court decision. So just one uh, follow-up. So our community is actually working on formalizing in logic privacy policies, in particular in the medical setting. There, of course, the goal is not to streamline a whole trial, but to streamline part of it until a certain point is reached where a human decision, the decision of the court has to be taken. But at least such a procedure would definitely streamline and speed up various parts of the trial. So that's kind of the goal of this kind of research. Question you have. Yeah. So, sorry, I just spent a few hours in this very room with Professor Bar Baron. They were very painful, so I'm no expert, so maybe it's a stupid question. But I was wondering why, except for the one mention of um, post quantum cryptification, there was no talk about um, quantum computing. So, they're supposed to change everything in terms of speed or, or, or privacy and so on. So do you think it's just way too far in the future, or is there a different reason why you didn't mention it? Anyone? OK, so I mean, uh, quantum computing, of course, is, is a great topic. I would love to build a quantum computer. So at the moment, it's just uh, I think there is, a, there is a lot of gap that we have to bridge between the quantum physicists and the computer scientists and computer architecture into Juliana. And I would fully agree to that, that we have to do this effort if we would want to have an impact now. I mean, I think you already know that Intel has released their quantum computing chip, which is a 15 uh, qubit. Uh, Microsoft released also a press release. They also made a press release. They have a 50 qubit, whatever, cloud-based, you know, quantum computer. And if we would like to really go towards this research direction, we have to bridge this gap. I think we need to do really across the whole faculty with the quantum physics and things like this. But of course, quantum computing, can really solve a lot of problems in terms of this thing. So I agree, but I don't know in 10 years, maybe. I mean, now the pace is very, very fast. We know that Google has also in five years their roadmap to really deliver uh, above 50 qubit kind of you know, quantum computers. So we have to move fast if we want to take leadership in this area. But in how many years do you think it will change your work? <laughs> Our work, I mean, it, it can, it can yes. change many things. I mean, it can really seriously affect the, as he said, cryptography security aspects, but it can also solve a lot of issues. But for example, that Ivona mentioned, really realizing a single chip cloud, data center kind of stuff, you know, you can have these kind of stuff effectively if you get these kind of systems. But 
um, we have to also realize the let's say the Microsoft whatever it released was only holding the correct state for few microseconds. So having a quantum computer which can really retain the state for a very very long time still a fantasy. I mean from my point of view. But maybe there is a breakthrough coming in quantum physics, making these materials very cheaper, available. Then we can realize. Maybe after one decade we can talk about that. So we are already thirsty. We have one <laughs> final question from the audience. Okay, um, good. It's a it's a higher level question. So um, it's, which is not in your particular fields. It's more about the future of computing because I've come here. Before I, before I came here, I attended a conference on um, the economics of digitization. Um, and it was very interesting because the economics discussed the effect of digitization, um, but actually admitted that it's very difficult to see when you look in the economic statistics. It seems like the progress uh, that probably we all in this room know about in computer science is just not very well visible uh, in, in economics at a, at a state level, right? And there may be several reasons. One is that it's not clearly visible because the, the economics data doesn't clearly show it. Um, for example, because many services don't cost anything that we are now using, so they are not there in the statistics. And another one may be that we have already harvested uh, the biggest innovations that computer science has to offer. So that's, that's something that the economists make a point of, giving also the example, you know, um, we now have modern toilets, but who cares about yet another app? So my question is, do you think the progress in the next 10 years will be more incremental? Or are we actually still going to see the kind of massive changes that we've seen in the past? So uh, I think everyone can answer that. Yes. I would like to take uh, it from the computing perspective, from the, let's say, my research area. Um, IEEE recently started a new thing called rebooting computing um, because the CMOS based technologies or the standard von Neumann computing architecture that we teach in our curriculum have really hit their you know, uh, border. And we are talking about more than more. So in terms of the fundamental research in computing architecture, this is the era of breakthroughs where we are now seeing every you know, six months, a great release coming about, you know, quantum computers, approximate computers, uh, phase change memory based, in memory computing, things like this. So this is what I'm talking about. And these technologies are extremely important to realize the immersive computing applications that we are talking about. You know, when we talk about IoT, it's just a start. And we talk about smart, this kind of stuff, but it's really the start of things. Um, once you want to have them completely immersive and embedded, you know, in our in daily life, uh, they have a lot of challenges, from cost to energy efficiency to reliability to security, all the way on these things. And there, I think, we need fundamental, um, uh, still foundations, new foundations from the computing technologies, hardware to software, and all the tools and things like this. So this is my take on that. Uh, maybe I give a high-level answer to the high-level question. So we don't like to be incremental. Okay. So if you would like to be incremental, then all big funding agencies would just disappear because they do like high risk, high impact projects. So I do believe that we are not going to be incremental. It depends how, defend, uh, how one defines incrementality. But I do believe that uh, in our field, maybe in my field, logic, automated reasoning, program analysis, software development, we do bring at, at least, I don't know, when, I don't want to put in the quantity, but there will be many breakthrough areas and many breakthrough results in the upcoming years. Ivona. <coughs> I have a bit different approach um, to think about the breakthrough. Uh, many of the breakthrough developments happen just by chance or of, because of someone was bored. I think the first email was written because someone wanted to know whether the coffee is ready or something like that. Also, the cloud computing was invented because Amazon just didn't, want, didn't know what to do with this amazing power that they have. So um, I think also the major breakthrough would happen because just by chance in the future or out of curiosity. I don't think that the big funding agency will drive it. Maybe. I don't know, so we will see. I think this would be a panel on its own, Yuri. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, since I realize I'm thirsty at least. Uh, uh, I have a final question, short, very short to you. Uh, since we are looking in these 10 years, 
how should the university look like in 10 years? Are we still the way we are doing? Or what should we do if there are event way there are breakthrough or breakdown? Or <laughs> Just as an open high level question. What is is it still with the we have we need more cross border centers, we need more cross border study programs, we need more interruption during your study so that you could go out and come back, things like that. Do we have to follow strict rules or should we break rules? If so, which rules to break? I think you already brought, so actually our faculty, I don't know if you really break the rule, but uh, what actually happened with this bachelor with honors program that we really, from, like, really brought a new program to the faculty or actually to the university and actually to Austria. And I think this is how university should act in the next years as well. Do, do new things that actually support excellence, but don't neglect basic foundations. Actually, basic foundation is fundamental because the new technology coming, the, the new thing comes, but if you know actually the, the, the foundational base, then you can catch up with them much easier. So I remember that like, I, like if, if you learn a programming language now, it's probably much better if you also do some kind of basic language so that when the new one will come, you can learn it in an easier way. Okay, let me give a short answer to that. Not detailed, but just a direction. So I think that great work has been done already. So as mentioned before, this Bachelor with Honors is an example. I think that we as a faculty and university should definitely strive for excellence at all levels, at the level of research, at the level of teaching. I think there is more to be done, and I think it's a call for all our colleagues to be brave, to leave a bit the comfort zone and to try to think together how could we shape our university in a way that we are not among the best 100 or among the best 50 or 60, but how can we make it actually into the best 10? And that's the question. And, and now I know that some people might not agree on that, we have the resources to do that. So it's a point on how actually to steer our efforts and our resources towards this vision. But it's, uh, a, it's a faculty model discussion. <laughs> it's a joint discussion and it's a joint vision that we have to shape. Yeah. But I guess uh, the one aspect of Hannah's question was also at the TUV level. And I think as a university level, I see there is a lot of potential that we have to expose across faculties to start the interfaculty, not only you know specialized masters, but also building um, clusters, you know, interfaculty clusters on on the hot topics. But we feel you know that when they are coming, we should not really wait and things like this. So there should be a lot of this kind of stuff. And you know that in Germany they already start this excellence programs and things like this. And uh, one of the so excellence is judged in various different categories. Whenever they are going to give these excellent budgets, but one of the key points is really coming up with these new clusters that will take your university, university we are talking, not faculty, university, in the top 10 list, for example, within 5 to 10 years. And this is what we need to draft a vision, I think, and I think you are playing a great role anyway there. Thank you. <laughs> Ivona? So she. <laughs> um, I have written down some words, but first of all I have to say thank you and I am proud of you. I think we can be happy that we succeeded in appointing you and that you accepted our offer. So it's, I think the university also has to be grateful that you joined our, our faculty and uh, you proved in this discussion that you are, yeah, you are ready to shape our joint future. Uh, Yes, let me just uh, talk, uh, I think, uh, in name of everyone. Actually, it's a honor for us to be here, and we are the ones that are actually thanking the university for giving us the opportunity to be here. Thank you. This is the glass of white wine afterwards. <laughs> now I'm in the PR mode. I Just before finishing, I would really uh, point you to a further panel discussion on the 4th of December, which is Monday, at also 5.30 p.m. in the Festsaal, which is in the uh, main building. And it's, the title is Living in the Cyber World, 
the land of humans and artificial intelligence. It's a panel discussion done by our, you know, the faculty has an international advisory board giving advice to the faculty into which direction to go. Also, for example, giving the advice to do the spectrum of his online, things like that. And the panelist will be Nadia Talman. She's from the University of Singapore. It's Hans Ackermann from the University of Amsterdam. Carlo Getzi from Politecnico di Milano. Uh, Ed Lee from Berkeley University and Moshe Wadi from Rice University. So these are very high standing computer science uh, researchers and they will talk about the book written by Ed Lee, which is Plato and the Nerd. It's somehow the starting of a philosophy of computer science and is it engineering, is it science? What is the interplay between humans and technology? What are the limits of technology? Uh, what can we prove and what can't we prove and things like that. And they will talk about this issue and you are, all of you are invited. Also there will be some drinks and some bread. Uh, I thank you, the audience. I thank the speakers. <laughs> but I would also like to thank uh, Eva Stracker, especially Daniela Neubacher who prepared this and who really made the things happen, and also the others who were <laughs> Thank you.